6.30, we begin the poster session, and then the poster session will continue into the Perativo, which begins in 7, okay? So uh, let's go ahead and begin. So it's a pleasure to welcome Juan Carlos Fernandez, who will be speaking on optimal partitions and prescribed Q curvature. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Azara and Mar, for the kind invitation. I actually invited myself here, <laughs> and they accepted to have me and to give a talk. And I'm going to, to talk something that, that I have been working with Professor Monica Clapp first, and Alberto Saldana, and then with Oscar Palmas and Jonathan Torres Orozco from the National Autonomous University of Mexico, UNAM. So uh, let's begin. What is the optimal partition? I will give you the intuition behind the optimal partition in a simple way, I hope. Imagine that you have two hertz of walls living on a manifold and that the, the food is distributed in, a, in an homogeneous way. So these walls, they hate each other. So, <laughs> so one of them, suppose this one is the, the strong one. So one of them will go away from this strong one and wants to hide and also wants to have its own territory. So in this manifold, I have put here a mountain. So uh, since they are living beings, they will try to conquer its territory, spending the least energy. So it is, it is harder for, uh, for this uh, wolf to get up in the, uh, onto the mountain and then hide behind it that, than, give, than say, give, um, traveling through this path, which is, uh, which is not, it, it does not have a mountain, and then hide. So if, uh, this wolf will spend this energy if he yeah, if he goes through here, then if he goes through this part and then down. So this is the, the way that he, uh, they are going to conquer their own territory. And with this, they are going to have some territory here for, uh, for the weak guy and maybe this for the stronger guy. So this is this is more or less the optimal partition. What happens, but- The strong guy has more territory? Maybe, maybe yes, maybe not. I, but in, if he spends the least energy, it's okay. Maybe if, because it is the strong one, the, he's not going to do anything and maybe he can win a, a lot of territory. And what happens if, if we have more, let me, more walls. Let me put another wolf here. They are reproducing. If we have more wolves, then one wolf will fight with this, and this one will fight with this, and it will look for its own territory in order to, to spend the least energy. So in this case, we are going to have a partition of the manifold into let's say, three parts, yeah? So the main thing here is how do they uh, describe their territories in order to spend the least energy possible? And this least energy will be governed by a PDE. So there is a competition, a competition PDE that will give also the energy that they will spend. So what I'm going to talk about is not the general optimal partition problem, but I'm going to talk about the partition problem with symmetries. So what happens if we have a symmetric manifold? For instance, here we have a more symmetric ambient. And so if this guy wants to get out from this other guy, it is the same that he flies away, he, he goes through here, or he goes through here, or through here, or, or even each path uh, he eats 
it chooses it is the same. So in this part, we will expect that the territories that they will conquer will be symmetric and will have the same symmetries that the manifold has. For instance, maybe the strong one, sorry, no, maybe the strong one has this up to here and the other guy will live in here. So um, they are respecting the symmetries. Yeah, this is roughly speaking the thing that I'm going to talk about, okay? The, the partial differential equation that will govern here the behavior and the energy will be the prescribed Q curvature equation, okay? So I'm going to talk about how these wolves uh, conquer their territory uh, using this prescribed Q curvature equation. What is the prescribed Q curvature equation? Professor Alice Chang has already mentioned a lot of things about Q curvature, and the fractional Q curvature, the integer uh, powers of, of the Laplacian, and et cetera, et cetera. So I will talk a little bit about uh, this prescribed Q curvature again. The motivation is, the simpler motivation is the Yamabe problem. The Yamabe problem states as follows. Imagine that you have a close Riemannian manifold with this really nasty um, scalar curvature. So you want to deform it in such a way that you preserve the angles and obtain a more regular manifold, say that the, the scalar curvature is constant. So this problem is equivalent to solving a PDE with critical sobel exponent, which is the, uh, this problem. This is this problem. Here we have the conformal Laplacian and the critical sobel exponent. So if you want to have a constant scalar curvature equals, say, to mu, you have to solve this equation and obtain u positive. And if you make this conformal change of metric, you are going to obtain in this new metric that the scalar curvature it will be constant equal to mu. Yeah, this problem has a solution. It was solved completely by Yamabe, Trudinger, Oban, and Shane. And this is the motivation of of the prescribed Q curvature problem. Why? Because if we look closer to the the conformal Laplacian. What is the conformal Laplacian? As Professor Alice Chang already said, it has a conformal, uh, a conformal property, which is the following one. If you consider a smooth function and you consider this conformal metric, it is the same to compute this conformal Laplacian in this new metric than to compute it with the original metric, metric, but paying the price that you have to multiply by these guys. Okay, that's the conformal property of the Laplace. And what are the, uh, the things that I, the operators that I will be using are the higher um, powers of the Laplacians given the, uh, the following way. Ah, yeah, I forgot. And also you can recover the scalar curvature by applying the, the conformal Laplacian to the constant function one, okay? So what happens with conformal operators of order M? M will be an integer number. I'm not, I'm not playing here with fractional Laplacians. And um, so I am going to take a, an integer number m, which is strictly less than n half. So the conformal operators are, the higher dimensional conformal operators are, roughly speaking, a power of the Laplacian plus something, lower order terms, okay? But they still have this conformal property that if we consider a smooth function and this uh, and this conformal metric, your, uh, it is the same to compute the, this operator uh, in terms of the new metric that 
than to compute in terms of the original map. Okay, and these uh, these operators were discovered or were defined. I don't know what happens there because sometimes we discover things, sometimes we define things, but these are due to Graham, Jean, Mason, and Sparling. These are the so-called G, G, J, M, S operators. So that Professor Alice Chang talked yesterday. Okay, so this is, these are the higher order conformal operators. And behind the higher order conformal operators, there is a conformal invariant, which is the Q curvature. Again, it is, if you evaluate one of these operators on the constant function one, you're going to obtain this Q curvature. So I am going to talk about optimal partitions for prescribed Q curvature equation. I haven't defined what is the prescribed Q curvature equation. And I'm going to play the same thing as in the Yamabe problem. So what is the prescribed Q curvature equation? Consider a closed manifold with a nasty Q curvature like this, and then try to do a conformal change of metrics in order, in order to obtain a new manifold, which has a more, a more regular uh, Q curvature. And in this case, again, this problem is equivalent to solving a PDE of this form. This is a PDE with this higher order conformal operator. I will call this one PG. And it has also a critical Sobolev exponent um, nonlinearity. So we have uh, in without symmetries, we do not have compactness. And again, if we consider a solution, a positive solution to this problem, and we consider this change of metric, what you're going to obtain is that if you compute the Q curvature in this new metric, you're going to obtain a Q curvature that will be equal to mu. So this is the prescribed Q curvature problem. Yeah? So I am going to study optimal partitions related to this problem. Okay? There are any questions here? No? So I may have one. Yeah. So the, the power is the critical one, job, because you usually write the, you to the power of power, or when you want to consider positive and negative, you want minus one. So you know, is that a typo, or you are really considering n plus two? No, that's n plus. To so M, M. yeah, that, that, that's, the, that's the critical Sobolev exponent minus two. I wrote it wrong. Uh, I have. Uh, it's, it's all right. That times you. Yeah. Okay. So this is the um, the um, prescribed Q curvature problem. So now, since I told you that the walls are going to conquer their territory and in the in my province i have some boundaries the the walls must have some boundaries in in order to describe their territories what happens here is that i will need to define this problem with a dirichlet boundary condition okay oh i forgot all these problems have been uh, have been studied by a lot of people. Most of them are here. For instance, Professor Alice, Alice Chang, Paul Yang, Gober, Gursky, and many others. And from the fractional Q curvature, also Professor Alice Chang, Maria del Mar Gonzalez, which uh, she is not here now, Azara de la Torre, Jeffrey Case, and many others. So now I will. I will pass to the, the main equations and the main statement of, of my talk. Since I wanted to study symmetric, symmetric optimal partitions, I will give you a symmetric domain. What is, what is going to be a symmetric domain is the following. Imagine that you have a subgroup of isometries. This must be a closed one. Yeah, and a gamma invariant domain. What is a gamma invariant domain? A gamma invariant domain is if you take one point 
and you take the action of this group, this is the orbit, the orbit will stay in this domain, okay? That's, that's the domains I will consider. For these domains, we can consider the curvature equation with, uh, with Dirichlet boundary condition, and we are going to look for gamma invariant solutions. So we are in the setting of a symmetric map, okay? And in this setting, this is um, the standard variational methods. One can show that for Einstein manifolds, why Einstein manifolds? Because in uh, the, this higher order conformal operator of Einstein manifolds are simple to manage. Why? Because one can decompose them as a sum of powers of the Laplace. So they are simpler. I put this condition here in order to assure that the operators are coercive. So there, we can define a Sobolev norm using these operators. And I put here, this maybe look strange, uh, that I am looking for positive dimensional orbits. Why? Because I want to restore compactness. We, we are dealing with a critical Sobolev exponent uh, equation, so we cannot use yeah, the usual Sobolev inequalities in order to have compactness. What we have to do is to use the classical Ebay and Bogon theorem from, uh, for um, Sobolev embeddings with symmetries. So one of the, the things that I must have in order to restore compactness is to have positive dimensional orbits. So with this, using the standard variational methods, one can obtain a least energy gamma invariant. A gamma invariant solution is a solution which is, which is going to be constant along the orbits. Yeah, so if we consider here an orbit and a point Y and a point X, so the solution is gamma invariant if this happens for each point in the orbit, okay? And what is the energy? The energy is going to be give, uh, given by this integral, yeah? So, and this energy is closely related to the equation that we are dealing with. So this is the energy, this is the equation. So I am going to give you now the precise description of the optimal partition problem with symmetries. What is the prescribed, the prescribed partition problem with symmetries? It is the following. Consider any positive integer and consider L domains, yeah? Is it possible to find a configuration of these domains in order to, to attain the minimum energy, the average of the, mini, the, the minimum energy in the average, because I'm, I'm summing all the energies in each domain. So that is minimize this sum, okay? Minimize the efforts that the wolves do in order to conquer their territories. Yeah? So your constraint, what is the constraint? I don't have a constraint. The, actually, here, the, the domains move, uh, can move uh, uh, with, with all the freedom they, they need. I will show how to construct this, these domains. It is a really, really beautiful idea given by Conti, Terracini, and Bettini in, in 2002. There are no constraints in the, in the boundaries. I have to look for the constraint in these boundaries. Oh, yeah, but I, am, I, I will look for gamma invariant domains. That, that's a constraint. I forget it. These are. This so will the be. Energy doesn't involve the derivative. No, mm, yes, but no. Yes, because actually they live in some in the, the the restriction called the Nehari manifold, and this codifies the energy as the derivative or as the as the energy I have written before. So it is when they live there, 
you can you can write the energy in terms of the, the integral of the of this guy or or this guy subject to the boundary conditions subject to the boundary conditions are you subjecting also to this being adaptation of the yes I guess. yes actually what we are going to obtain is that it is a partition of the manifold here in the statement it could be it may be not a partition of the manifold yeah but what we are going to obtain is that actually it is a partition of the manifold okay at least you're drawing here it makes it makes look like they might just be lip shits or something and then you... no that, that's a mistake oh, okay, okay. let's right. let's make that's okay All right. let's yeah. smooth the domains a little bit okay. yeah 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 okay so the method was in, uh, what uh, was introduced by Ponti, Terracini, and Pertini, and some colleagues, for, for instance, Monica Club, Alberto Saldana, and Andre Sulkin, apply this method to the Yamabe equation on the sphere, but having a really precise geometry. This is the route that they are taking. So these are you are rotating in one, in one direction, direction and you're rotating in another direction, okay? Together with Monica and Alberto, we obtained the same optimal partition problem with this symmetry on the sphere, okay? Clap and, and Angela Pistoia, they obtained the optimal partition for more general symmetries. And Clap, Pistoia, and Hugo Tavares, they obtain the optimal partition without the, uh, without the symmetry assumption. So what is the main difference between these two works and these two works? In this one, the domains and the boundaries that they obtain uh, as a solution are not clear. They describe it as having some household measure, something like that. It, it is more or less <coughs> that you obtain a kind of orbifold or something like that. And if we introduce nice symmetries, for instance, these ones, we get a concrete description of the boundaries and the, um, and the sets forming this optimal partition, okay? So I'm going to talk about now about the symmetries that we are going to use. And the symmetries that we are going to use behave like these ones, okay? So I continue. And these symmetries are called homogeneity one actions on a manifold. What is a homogeneity one action on a manifold? You have a group, a Lie group acting on a Lie group, a group of symmetries acting on your manifold in order that each orbit like this, each principal orbit has codimension co one. It is a hypersurface in your manifold. In this case, in the homogeneity one action on, oh, sir, you don't have, you don't have to see this. Um, in this, in this case, what you can do, what you obtain actually is that there are only two singular orbits, which are here written um, as M plus and M minus. And also one can define the distance between these two manifolds and the distance between the singular orbit and the principal orbits. Let's say that this distance is R of X. If X is here. So what is the, the main reason that we are taking this kind of symmetries? Because in this case, one can identify the manifold with this foliation, with its principal and singular orbits, we can identify it with an interval. So actually we are reducing everything to a one dimensional problem. And I will state, uh, state this in a really concrete uh, in a really concrete way. So we have 
this reduction, I'm identifying each orbit with a point and I am obtaining an interval via the, the distance function. And the main property of the distance function is the following thing that everyone has already done in, in their PDE's uh, first course, which is the following. Remember that on Rn, we can compute the radial Laplacian, okay? So this is a kind of radial Laplacian. If you consider any smooth, fu smooth function on this interval and you compose it with this, this actually is a function with lives in your Sobolev space with symmetries. So if you compute this, you're going to obtain a kind of generalized radial Laplacian, which, is, which has really nice geometry. This operator, which I will call L, like Laplacian, is take two times the derivative, one time the derivative, and, he, and here we have another term. This is the mean curvature of the principal orbits. So this guy, is measuring is measuring the uh, the mean curvature of each one of these principal orbits. Okay, so it is a kind of radial Laplacian, but on a general manifold. Yeah, and also we can cut off these manifolds and we can decompose the metric in such a way that we are actually dealing with a cylinder okay so it is uh, with these actions we are reducing everything to one single orbit let's say that i will choose the one in the middle and an interval so that's the that's the magic in between everything some consequences that we obtain uh, from this construction are the following ones Again, I am going to restrict myself to Einstein manifolds. Why? Because the higher order conformal operators are going to be given by, by sums of Laplace. Okay? That's why I'm, I have to restrict myself to these operators, these manifolds, sorry. And again, I will use the magic of homogeneity one actions. The first thing that we obtain is that everything is one dimensional, meaning that if you consider the Sobolev space with symmetries, with this kind of symmetries, this is isometric to a Sobolev space on the interval. So we are reducing everything to a one dimension, but we have to pay, some, to pay a price and the price is that we obtain a Sobolev space, oh, sorry, a Sobolev space with a weight. And this weight is, let me hide that. And this weight is given by the volume of each orbit, okay? This is one of the main results. Another one is that since we are actually dealing with one dimensional problems, what we can do is we reduce everything to an ODE, which is simpler to manage, okay? So if we consider a gamma invariant domain like this, which corresponds to an interval, and we consider Dirichlet boundary condition here, what we obtain is that we can reduce everything to the kind of generalized radial Laplacian to this kind of ODE. I, I have told you that this, is, this operator is given by second derivative plus HT, the mean curvature of that. So this is an ODE and it is simpler, okay? Now, our third main result, our third result using these symmetries is that 
we have a kind of symmetric principle of unique continuation. What do I mean with this? Imagine that you have a gamma invariant solution of this equation on this domain. And imagine that you, that restricted to a smaller gamma invariant domain, this solution is zero. So in one dimension, we are looking for something like this. We have the, the Dirichlet boundary condition, and we are saying that our solution is zero in an open set. But this time it is an open set, which is invar gamma invariant. So since we are reducing everything to an ODE, actually we have that this must be zero as a consequence of existence and uniqueness theory. That's all the trick, okay? So these are the, the main tricks that we use uh, in order to reduce everything to a one dimension. And now I will give you our main result, which is a solution to the gamma invariant optimal partition problem, but giving a precise description of the domains. Yeah, in terms, in terms of the orbits and the singular orbits, okay? So again, we need this in order to control this operator. We need this in order to reduce everything to one dimension. And we need this to restore compactness, okay? So we, get, we actually get a solution to the gamma invariant optimal partition problem. This is now a partition of the manifold, of the full manifold, in such a way that we are going to have two distinguished um, domains, which is this one and this one. This one is going to be a tubular, a tubular neighborhood around this singular orbit, this is this one, and this one is going to be a tubular, a tubular neighborhood around this second or uh, this second tubular or, um, singular orbit. Okay. Moreover, the boundary, the boundary is going to be given by the principal orbit. They are the all the boundaries will be. Uh, diffeomorphic actually parallel to the um, to the principal orbit. And what happens if we consider this these domains? These domains are actually cylinders with the principal orbits, and their boundaries are given by two copies of the principal orbit. So we are describing, we have a precise description of these domains. And how, uh, how we obtain them, in how, how do we make, um, make that we have the first one, the second, how can we order these domains? Because we're reducing everything to one dimension and here we can put an order and then take these sets back in here. I am not telling you that, it, that that is the strategy to find the domains. The, the, the domains follow, the, the existence of these domains follows the strategy given by Conti, Bert, uh, Bertini and Susanna Terracini's approach, okay? So this is our main result. And I want to talk about a little bit about the, the proof of this result, which is really, really beautiful and it's the following one. The approach is you're considering L hertz of volts. L, you're considering L species that are competing with each other, okay? This, is, this can be translated to something that is called weakly coupled competitive systems. So we have here the Q curvature equation, plus a competing term, okay? And 
This is a competing term with these guys. These guys are going to be negative. If these lambdas are positive, this is another problem with which is, which is called the cooperative problem. They do not hate each other, they love each other, okay? So, I am, I am taking the, the, the question in which each herd hate each other. First, we need to see that this, the system has solutions and we using standard variational methods, using these guys here in order to, to control coercivity and in order to restore compactness. And in this way, we obtain a least energy gamma invariant solution to this equation. So we have here, imagine that each of these solutions represent the, the energy spent by each of the species, okay? So what is the idea? The idea is that if you consider a sequence of this lambda ij in order that they go to minus infinite, imagine that minus infinite is that they hate each other in an infinite way. They really, really hate them. So we begin with, this competi uh, with these two competitive species. As the parameter k goes to minus, uh, as the parameter k goes to infinite and these guys go to minus infinite, the species, the species begin to segregate. This is a, uh, something called segregation phenomenon, okay? And actually, in a suitable Sobolev space, this solution, these least energy solutions are going to converge to something, yeah? And this, I will call I, uh, u infinite and i and u infinite j for two, species, for two species. So how can we construct the domains? We, have, we can show that the supports are disjoint. And so since we need an open set, take the interior of the supports. And that's the proof. That's, that's the idea of the proof, OK? And there's a relation between this and sign changing solutions to, uh, to Q curator equations. Well, I am lying a little bit because we only obtained the sign changing solutions for the Yamaha equation. Why? Because for the conformal Laplacian, we have the maximum principle. And with the maximum principle, we can say that these least energy solutions are positive. So how can we obtain using a solution to the optimal partition problem? How can we obtain a solution to the, the Yamabe problem? Just put one positive solution here, one negative, positive, negative, positive, negative, as, you, uh, as many as you want, and you are going to obtain a sign changing solution. This is the, <coughs> this is the main, <coughs> sorry, this is the main feature of, um, the main application of optimal partitions in this, in this kind of equation. So for first order, this is a, so a sign changing solution to the Yamaha problem, having exactly as many nodal domains as you want. You can prescribe the number of nodal domains and also you can prescribe the geometry of the nodal domains. The nodal sets are going to be given by this, uh, these orbits given by the homogeneity one action. So you can describe it in, uh, in a concrete way, okay? So this is take positive, negative, positive, negative, positive. We cannot, uh, we cannot do the same trick with higher order conformal operators because we do not have the maximum principle uh, in general, okay? That's, that's why we couldn't obtain this. Actually, what we wanted to prove is a result like this for higher order conformal operators, but we couldn't do it. Our methods were, were, no, um, were not good enough to prove this. 
and few words about work in progress. Uh, together with Hector Chang Lara from, uh, from CIMAT Guanajuato and Alberto Saldaña from UNAM, we are, um, we are trying to solve the optimal partition problem for fractional Q curvatures on the sphere. And also we are dealing with optimal partition problems for the generate equation, that is equations having uh, a pila plasma. And the open question, if someone knows how to, how to manage the, this lack of maximum principle, is, is it true that one can prescribe the number of nodal domains for the Q curvature equations? That's something that we do not know. And thank you very much for your attention. Sorry, because you avoid the kernel of the Yeah. Actually, I think I was going to ask the same question, but let me make sure I understand. So, so you had the Einstein condition. Yeah. Right. So. It, that's only used for coercivity. There's no other. It's not used in no, any no. other. It, it is. It is used for coercivity and also in order to reduce everything to a one dimension. Why? Because the the thing that is behind everything is that if you consider a gamma invariant so, uh, a gamma invariant function, this is a function defined on your interval composed with this function, and this is plus h w this guy so what uh, why are we using uh, einstein metrics because the higher order conformal operators can be decomposed as sums of laplacians no it's not n okay that's why so i am using we are using this decomposition here and with this with these guys using both, we obtain uh, the the precise uh, Sobolev norm in the uh, for the one-dimensional problem. Okay. That, that's the idea. Further question? Okay, let's uh, sing one last again. <laughs> And you may have noticed that the posters are already set up out here in the, in the hallways, and so we can move out there as already. Okay, so, this, all right, so I, I, I want to make sure I understand the logic of it. They call them a